four, three, two, one. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this session on fostering Africa's renewable energy transition that we co-host. And we are very glad as CSR Europe to co-host this with uh, the Rest for Africa Foundation. And I must say, looking at the entire program of this European SDG Summit, it does not have enough Africa on its program. So I cherish, I apologize for that, and I cherish this session. I see there are some other sessions on raw materials in the automotive sector and due diligence and supply chains. But those sessions tend to be maybe too much from a rather European-centric perspective on it's related to the due diligence uh, law, etc. that is coming up, and how do we make more sustainable supply chains. But this session, I think, is from a different angle. And we need to indeed to make more effort, inviting our neighbors in Africa to bring their perspective, their approach. And with CSR Europe, I think, as an executive director, I can say we need to improve on that. And the Rest for Africa Foundation helps us with that. Because we all know Europe needs Africa in a way as well. And together, we can make sustainable transformation that is outlined also in the Green Deal in the next generation Europe. And as in all matters, sustainability, three elements are essential, I think, to drive this change. One is genuine partnerships and engagement. The second one is a shared vision. And the third one is the finance to make it all happen and the right financial means and instrument and frameworks to make all that happen. And that's why I'm glad with the agenda that we could compile together with, and, and that is on the next slide, that we could compile together with uh, the Rest for Africa Foundation. I'm not going to go in detail of that agenda now, it will unfold and you have seen it before, but you will, see, you will have seen that with this focus on finance, we could bring together a number of speakers with a strong track record on engagement and also with expertise, practical expertise on these topics. And we have a good mix of policy makers, business people, development agencies, investors. And together with them, I propose for us to, uh, to explore the key challenge, to see how can we overcome the challenge of finance systems, how to make the necessary investment for that also will unlock further private investment uh, in the area of renewable energy. Just from a practical point of view, if we, if we go one or two slides further, this session has, of course, a lot of speakers, but also we would invite the public to engage on this session through the live discussion button that you have on your screen, where you can put question, put remarks in the chat, put questions in the question part. I don't think there is a poll in this session, but please, I would invite you also to share resources that you have or that uh, that you want to look for uh, on this chat and questions that would be makes it more interactive and richer than the normal uh, just speaking. You can also engage with the speakers or with or do with the other attendees. If you go on the next slide, it shows where there is a button on the speakers on the screen and a button for networking. So you are invited to use that facility as well. And last but not least, there is also the resources of CSR Europe on this area that you can find and you can reach out to people in the staff of CSR Europe uh, by clicking on that CSR toolbox button. That is for the practicalities. I introduced briefly the team, but I'm very glad and honored that Salvatore Bernabe could make the time as the CEO of NL Green Power, but also as the president of Rest for Africa Foundation. Uh, to give a further content introduction on the topic for our uh, discussion today. So, Mr. Bernabe, the floor is yours. Thanks. Uh, thank you very much, Stefan, for giving me the possibility uh, to share with you these introductory remarks. Um, I will be very brief, but I will also try to be um, very uh, clear and get to the point. Uh, Africa is a continent that, that is uh, continuously under transformation. Uh, in this moment, Africa, not only Africa, are uh, experiencing this difficult uh, moment of the pandemic. And uh, what we think is that uh, Africa will recover by 2021 from uh, what has been uh, perhaps the worst economic recession in Alpha Century. Uh, although there are some uh, differences among the, the countries of Africa, 
we also see <clears throat> that one out of four people in the mid-century uh, will, will live in Africa. So there is a trend of transformation of, uh, in this case, of, of growth of population that uh, um, at the end uh, will make the case that one out of four people will live in Africa. And at the same time, there is the trend of uh, urbanization of people moving from the, uh, the country to the urban and peri-urban areas. That is a trend that will continue also in the next uh, uh, decade. And the half of these uh, people half of this 1.7 billion people that we envisage in Africa 2030 will live in these areas. So uh, in order to make sustainable this transformation uh, is needed uh, definitely uh, a sustainable access to electricity. Electricity that should be affordable, uh, electricity that should be cheap, uh, electricity that should be uh, sustainable. That means green, but not only green. When we speak about sustainable energy, we refer also to the fact that there are some other uh, benefits apart, apart from the economic, uh, the, the environmental one. So being green helps to fight the climate change, but all the positive consequences in terms of uh, social impact, the creation of new jobs, uh, the possibility of new uh, companies or new enterprise to grow, and also the possibility to improve the health systems, but also to improve the quality of life. All of this is related in the world of today to the access to electricity. And uh, we want this access to be cheap as told before, and renewables today are the technology that allows this objective and to be achieved. Uh, saying that uh, the reality tell us and the figures are what they are, that in the last decade, only 2% of the additional capacity of renewables have been installed in Africa. And so why is the question? If we know that the electricity and green one has so fundamental role in a sustainable development of Africa, why only 2% of investment in the last decade? Uh, that's why as Race for Africa, uh, we have uh, here a plan, we have an action. We, we are a foundation uh, composed by different members of the private sector with the aims of creating a bridge, uh, a bridge among uh, our experience, our vision and the African stakeholders. And we want to make possible the creation of an enabling, an enabling environment that would make possible this investment to arrive to, adapt to Africa. We want to make attractive the investment to be made in Africa. And uh, going deeper in what are the real hurdles today to attract these investments, uh, we find that there is an issue about risks, political risk, economical risk, social risk. There are different kinds of risks that have to be managed. And looking what has been done so far, we found that the different instruments that were also put at disposal of uh, private investors uh, were effective from a certain angle, but they were limited, they were fragmented. So our proposal through an initiative that we call the Renew Africa within the activity of Rest for Africa, and then Mr. Vigotti was also connected, we elaborate on after more in detail, is uh, to create uh, a comprehensive framework for the risking of the investment. So we want to work uh, through Rest for Africa, Renew Africa with the country stakeholders, uh, investing a lot on the training, uh, on the technical assistance, on the capability building, but also working in how to change the regulatory framework, what intervention should be made in order to mitigate this risk. And we are also speaking with the European Union in order to create this framework that could make possible a, a bigger attra attractiveness for, uh, for investment. Uh, time uh, to act is now, is a motto that is repeated and has been repeated also uh, some uh, days ago in Milan at the Precop 26, uh, and it was also shouted by the young uh, generation. Time to act, to act is now, but not to uh, go through a, a transition. Uh, uh, in Africa, we are not speaking about transition. We are speaking about development. We are take this momentum. There is a big momentum in the world when you speak about uh, energy transition. And we have to use this momentum and to convey all our effort, public and private effort, because this is the only possibility to do it, 
to leverage on this momentum and to make happen, happen a real sustainable development from the beginning, from scratch, designing a new solution for Africa that will be circular, that will be sustainable from the beginning and make it in the way so that the investor could perceive and reduce the risk and could finally increase this 2% ridiculous percentage to a big, a big, much ambition goal in the next decade. So thank you very much for your attention and I leave now the floor to the other speakers that will certainly elaborate more to what could be done for Africa in the next decade. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Bernabe, for, for outlining the challenges ahead and, and indeed showing the gap and, and the possibility of, of improvement on that. We have as a next speaker, as a keynote speaker, and we are very happy. And Mr. Dooms, it's the second time I think we, we are really abusing you a little bit in this summit, but you are in an important position as Director General of DG International Partnerships in the Commission, and also very much engaged on the topic of renewable energy and on the financing mechanisms. So we are very happy to have you as a keynote speaker and I give the floor to you. But thank you again for being with us. <clears throat> thank you, thank you very much. And it's uh, it's really a pleasure. And I think that, I mean, uh, with, with Salvatore uh, Bernabe, we, we've been in a number of conferences uh, lately. And, and, and to be honest, I think this is how it should be. Given the topic we're talking about, uh, renewable energy in Africa, um, as, as Salvatore said, we, we can see how the momentum is there, and uh, and as always, you need to uh, you need to mold the iron while it's hot, and I think that that's what we're uh, we're trying to do here. Um, so really, very uh, very pleased to be here um, with you, and I will pick up on a point that that Salvatore uh, mentioned basically to start with, which is we, we've of course when we discuss Africa. Um, are, are looking um, at it from, from the COVID-19 uh, point of view. Uh, the impact that uh, the lack of proper vaccine sharing has on, on, on the continent, not only on Africa, but, but, but definitely Africa is, uh, is not well served um, from, from that point of view. And concomitantly, the impact uh, that COVID has on its, um, its economic position. But if we look beyond COVID and, and reimagine, and it's not that difficult to do, a path where Africa reconnects strongly with recovery. And we then look at recovery that is future proof. I think that, that's the point of, I mean, that's the starting point for me. And, and there I would want to make basically five points. First of all, on this topic, I really see how much Europe and Africa are really united, how we are in this together. On the one hand side, the global community, which, which Europe, as you all know, is trying to lead when it comes to the race to, to net zero, it's very clear that we need Africa for, for, that, for that endeavor. Because even if Africa, um, today, Africa's contribution to greenhouse gas emission is small, it will inevitably rise as the continent industrializes unless there are mitigating steps taken. I mean, emissions could double from the current 440 megatons of carbon dioxide to 840 by 2030. So, so the, the fight against global warming, uh, Africa is a key partner in it. Otherwise, if you look at it from an African point of view, if Africa does not decarbonize, if it doesn't embrace the kind of low zero or net zero dynamics of the of future economy, its industries risk becoming incompetitive in the long term as the rest of the world really pulls ahead towards uh, the, the green transition. So in that sense, um, shifting to renewables is not just an environmental issue. It's really, um, I mean, there's a real uh, economic rationale behind it with, with green growth that could create around 3.8 million net new jobs by 2050. Uh, so you, you can clearly see how, how the economic and environmental logic there really uh, merge. Which brings me to my second point, which is that if you look at it from that angle, the opportunities in Africa are really vast and boundless. I mean, Africa can turn actually its 
relatively small manufacturing sector to its advantage. Building on, I mean, building a low carbon sector and industrialization from the ground up and avoiding the expensive transition from fossil fuels to renewables that uh, developed countries must uh, navigate. To do so, it harbors all the possible potential and advantages it has. I mean, it holds a huge potential for renewable energy, wind, solar, hydropower, geothermal. It has 60% of the world's uncultivated arable land, and it has the youngest and fastest growing population. Of course, as Salvatore said as well, the continent does not start from scratch, and more than 60 million people in Africa already use off-grid solar power, making it, by the way, the continent with the largest proportion of its population using off-grid solar energy. And if you look at the number of people gaining access to electricity, I mean, it has doubled from 9 million uh, a year between 2000 and 2013 to 20 million a year between, nine, between 2014 and 19. So outpacing population growth. So that was my second message, which is the potential is huge and the, dimension, the, the momentum is, is the right one. Which brings me to my third point now. What's the EU's policy uh, towards Africa and renewable energy? We're basically developing, I mean, we're building on a, on a very strong policy of over the past few years, and we intend to strengthen that, basically looking at four big building blocks. The first one is, of course, to work with African partners to improve the policy environment, developing green growth strategies and putting in place the right enabling regulatory framework for investments. The second building block is about unlocking green finance, which is absolutely necessary in light of the investment gap. So we want to mobilize at a much greater scale green finance in Africa. Um, that would obviously require the development of a strong pipeline of bankable green projects, the development of new green financing instruments, and the establishment of a transparency verification system that gives investors the kind of confidence. And this is absolutely what we want to work on as well. Three, in parallel, we want to invest in the skills of the workforce. I mean, most of those potential new 6 million jobs to be created will be in sectors that are either at, at an incipient stage or do not necessarily exist already. And we can support it. We want to support governments to somehow anticipate those future uh, skills. And four, of course, accelerate research and development, because in a context where the aim is to create new green jobs, sectors and technologies that are relevant and adapted to Africa require to be boosted as well. These are elements we have been discussing with African partners, with the private sector, with the development finance institutions. And the, the purpose is really to gear up for the next um, Europe-Africa summit, uh, which should probably happen in, in the course of February uh, of, of next year, so that we can go there with a multi-stakeholder um, platform that really develops the kind of EU, AU green energy initiative that turns this policy into concrete action. That brings me to my fourth and, and final point, which is what about the means to, to deliver on this policy? Um, because of course, um, tapping into these opportunities will really require a coherent, strong effort from all relevant stakeholders, governments, development partners, development finance institutions, businesses, investors, and civil society. Um, and so we are looking, we've been putting in place a number of, of tools to do so. The first one is, of course, the new external budget um, for the EU, 2020, 2021-27, uh, which is called the Neighborhood Development uh, International Cooperation Instrument, Global Europe. I prefer to refer to it as Global Europe. Um, and the programming of this new budget is, is ongoing. Uh, approximately 30 billion uh, euros will be allocated to Sub-Saharan Africa. And I expect that around 10% of it will be dedicated in total to renewable uh, energy. As part of that, we have importantly the European Fund for Sustainable Development, um, which offers close to 40 billion globally in guarantees to de-risk sizable part of it, again, 
will go to uh, Africa and it will leverage investments of up to 11 times the, the amount. So we're really equipped there with the instruments to, to generate sizable financial mobilization. This is further backed up by a comprehensive sustainable finance strategy, which we expect to adopt in the second half of, of next year, that will specifically support low and middle income countries in scaling up sustainable investment and accelerating the flow of private capital to such uh, sustainable uh, projects. And finally, of course, uh, the work we've, we've piloted under COVID-19 is the Team Europe approach, where we work much more closely together with our member states in their bilateral actions and with the development finance institutions so as to really uh, offer to our partners the full force of, um, of Team Europe. I close by saying that I, I really sense an appetite in all the conferences we attend, the talks we have, the platforms we have, a real appetite from European businesses uh, to, to discuss and be part of this endeavor on sustainable energy uh, in Africa. And it was the case last April when we organized this high level uh, energy business event that hosted more than 3000 participants and more than 60 business organizations. And we are building on this in view of the summit in, in February, where we will organize a new edition of the Europe Africa Business Forum with sectoral policy focuses. And obviously we'd be very keen to pay specific attention to renewable sustainable energy in Africa. I will stop there. Thanks a lot and really a pleasure again to be with you. So Gus, thank you very much for this comprehensive overview. If I may, because it's I didn't hear of it yet. One question about Team Europe. What is the image you have that that the Commission would do there, on the with the bilaterals? Well, T Team Europe. Team Europe actually started from the premise that somehow we we punch uh, below our weight. Somehow we are like a like a like a football team uh, that has. Um, um, several very good players, but we don't play as a team. Now, if there's one thing that we can take away, I think from the, the European um, um, Championship football, which Italy, by the way, convincingly uh, won, is that um, the capacity to play as a team, not just the individual capacity of individual, individual players, but the capacity to really play as a team is a defining factor. And I, I it, I mean, when I saw the Italian team uh, playing, I was reminded of it because that's exactly what we're trying to do with Team Europe. We have at the EU level as an EU, but also our individual member states, France, Italy, Germany, Spain, the Netherlands and so on. We are all active in Africa. We are all active, or most of us, on renewable energy. Our European development finance institutions, KFW, IFD, the EIB, and so on, are active in Africa in this area. Mm -hmm. And Team Europe means that we discuss not downstream and compare notes on what everyone's doing, but upst upstream in a strategic way now, where should we be? Where's the real potential? On what do we want to focus our collective force? And that I think will make us uh, not just um, better uh, better partners uh, for for our african counterparts and for the various businesses but also ultimately deliver a europe that is more visible that is stronger and that can drive its own policies better thank you very much it's, it's very clear and also very encouraging i think uh, talking from more than from automotive sector and supply chain perspective we see a lot of smaller initiatives but I think a Team Europe can help on that agenda as well. Thank you for, for this presentation. I'm going to turn the floor now to Roberto Vigotti, the Secretary General of the Rest for Africa Foundation, and also the driving force, I think, on this agenda, <laughs> and who brought together a panel that is impressive in its own uh, being. So, Roberto, the floor is yours, and I look forward to the insights from the panel. Thank you so much, Stefan, for the introduction. Uh, I hope you can have, uh, I can have the slide uh, because I'm going to present shortly the Renew Africa initiative for those who may not be familiar. 
uh, and I want to thank again uh, uh, Mr. Gundens for the support he seems to have in uh, uh, observing what we are doing uh, and providing constantly the point of view of private sector for encouraging a policymaker in Brussels to uh, be successful. I will present shortly uh, my um, the slide, if I can have the slide. And I want to remind only that what uh, Mr. Benabe said before, this is uh, the um, publication on why only 2% in Africa. You can download from your our website. I think it's an impressive study we have done to contribute exactly to the appreciation of the issue. We know 2% is a scandal because 2% in the Africa continent is, and we dedicated 75 slides you can download from our website to understand why. I think this is really the first contribution we gave. Now, next slide also shows uh, the why we started in New Africa. When we started in Africa, we said that uh, while the interest of the members is very high, uh, we don't see uh, things happening because uh, uh, what is missing actually is uh, the uh, risk perception that the, our investors uh, have. We analyze uh, um, uh, all the all the. Uh, instruments uh, there and you can see from the right maybe you don't see very well but you will download later that uh, very few instruments cover the full range of uh, technology country and also the full range of the risking so we decide to work together on a european level we have 25 leaders in europe and we try to provide the commission and also the african leader our point of view next slide uh, you see here in the next slide the logo of the um, entity, let's say not only company, we have a European investment bank, many EDFAI, we have investor, we have a consultant, we have utility, and all of them gathered together for a couple of years to provide the input necessary both to Brussels and both to Africa. Next slide, in fact, shows you exactly the, the in a nutshell what we are. Now, we are not asking to create a new instrument, but we suggest to consolidate under one umbrella the many existing European instruments. And therefore we want to have the, uh, to clarify that the ownership of anything will happen is still in Brussels, while we will still comment and available to uh, improve your decision making. This is, will cre should create a, a comprehensive program that will cover all the country, uh, technology neutral, uh, including also the grids and the infrastructure, which so far have not been uh, supported by investors. You, you know very well that in Africa, the grids and infrastructure are monopolistic and most of them, unfortunately, are bankrupt. So we need to support with a guarantee private sector investment there. And of course, uh, also uh, uh, other uh, uh, features that you will see. Next slide also. Uh, shows you the our vision in the, in the program. We have been working in four uh, um, um, big groups. You see there the name. We think that the elements of policy dialogue, capacity building, technical assistance, and financial support have been prepared so that at the, at the end of the game, we will contribute to create a pipeline or bankable project at scale that no single instruments can be provided. You are familiar with the Scaling Solar or the World Bank. They work for many years, a big team, and they're not being impactful. So I think we should insist on providing an overall view from the European players there. Next slide shows also you the, um, the how we supported the, the work. We have been working for a year and a half. We have decided to country prioritize six countries. You'll see which one are later. We decided also to, uh, again, provide a selected uh, European private sector voice that should serve as a survey for investors to increase investment. And uh, there are two main uh, actions now in this moment we are doing. Presenting the New Africa recommendation to the DFAI and the European Investment Bank to assist them in structuring the financial guarantee and expanding outreach activity in selected African country. Next slide summarizes a full um, area of work. We are making a proposal to for a financial instrument and uh, the, we have prepared a summary memo, you see, they've been um, uh, prepared and presented. 
on the real and perceived investment risk by private sector and the presentation we gave to uh, the, a, a special meeting for a European multilateral and bilateral was uh, really well received and we will be delighted to keep assisting the um, uh, entity uh, who will present the proposal to the Commission uh, as uh, we want to play potentially a role of a sounding board to keep uh, feeding uh, the policymaker on their point of view. We again are here to improve, not certainly, because at the end of the game, when this instrument will be there, we will disappear and we will start running to get the guarantee. It's very clear we, do, we are not made a company to make an instrument. We are making things happening for the right instrument so that we can apply and make things happen in Africa. That should be very clear. Finally, the next slide, almost closing, the next slide shows our rolling out, we had decided an action plan to go in the country in Africa, and they are starting with the Mozambique, and they have the pleasure and the honor to introduce every, every today our ambassador, European ambassador in Mozambique. Then we go to Kenya, Ghana, Senegal, uh, Cote d'Ivoire, and, uh, and Ethiopia, one by one, in order to promote uh, um, our ideas and uh, make them aware that our work in Brussels and in Luxembourg is such that they may be a candidate to be the first one to uh, accept uh, such a scheme and encourage the policymaker in Brussels to um, that this is the right way to go. Whatever the name will be, we don't care, Rune Africa will be any name, but at least the components of these things should be there. So really, we are very pleased. We started in Mozambique. We are going back to Mozambique, and then we go to Kenya and Ghana. But I think the ambassador will also mention this one. And finally, the last slide, it's the, um, uh, yes. When we go to Africa, we don't only propose Renew Africa. We propose uh, uh, so many of our products. I want to just to show you our a flagship book that was uh, presented last year, which is called uh, Scaling Up uh, uh, in Europe in Africa. And uh, we do uh, the project UNECA, the so-called missing link. We are analyzing 17 country policy and regulatory framework to see if they are open, if they are ready, and if they are attractive. And this done together with UNECA and with the African experts. So we are going to present in each country the results specific of the country. We are going to present a survey on the risk investment based on more than 100 investors, a real-time survey to show our uh, perception, which perception, which they could take into account. And of course, we are ready in our tradition. We have a very strong track record of uh, capacity building. We are ready to present, uh, supported probably by the European Investment Bank, a ad hoc uh, training course uh, dealing with those three, four critical factors that each country will show. So this is a comprehensive approach we are going to propose. I think that's my last slide. Uh, just to, to frame the, um, the the context, and now the pleasure to introduce. Of course, you can download the slide, or you can write to me, and I can provide you additional things. I have the pleasure now to introduce the first panelist, Tarie Gabesin, the managing director of, and chief officer of IRM Arit. They are really important because they do invest in infrastructure in Africa, and are really keen to listen to their point of view on how they experience the investment in large scale infrastructure in Africa. So the floor is yours. Thank you for joining us, Antalya. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Vigotti, for having me um, as part of this uh, stellar panel. Um, it's very interesting to hear all the interventions being made by um team europe in um energy energy access um renewable energy transition for africa um so i'm the ceo of arm harris which is um, an infrastructure private equity fund investing in west africa and based in lagos and i've been investing in infrastructure real assets and energy for uh just over 15 years um, and we've all, um, and our fund has invested in several of the utility scale projects um, uh, in West Africa. And we're also currently embarking on uh, closing out a few projects in the distributed off grid space. And more recently, we launched um, our second fund, which is the ARM Harrod Cities and Climate Transition Fund, which is um, a climate infrastructure fund focused on urban West Africa. And so 
we're very active in the sort of renewable energy transitioning space, um, especially um, sort of looking at how do we position um, Africa, West Africa for a low carbon future. And so a lot of what's been talked about to date is very um, relevant for our work, but I, I would like to speak a little bit um, almost as tales from the ground. So for those of us who are actually trying to get capital out the door, um, putting capital in projects, um, we manage capital from Nigerian pension funds and DFIs. So we deal with both the Nigerian institutional investor as well as the DFIs. And so we invest according to kind of best ESG practice, but we need to have a commercial return. And now we're laying on climate criteria into the work that we do. And I think what was said earlier is that, um, and it's been coming out in some of the conversations is that, you know, Africa isn't actually transitioning in that we are, we are transitioning implies that there is actually an, an energy base, um, you know, for many African countries, there really isn't much of an energy base. And so we're not transitioning, rather we are building um, our energy profile and we're developing access, um, you know, and, and I think that's very crucial um, is just this with this concept that Africa is the lowest of the emitters. And what we're trying to prevent is a rapid escalation of emissions but more importantly, how to develop, build out our access and do it by building low carbon pathways so that we are well aligned for um, the new green order um, of things. And, um, and renewable energy is going to be crucial to that future because for Africa to actually be aligned with um, ultimately the, the Paris agenda, the, the renewable energy uptake and uptake is going to be massive. I mean, we're going to need to almost increase our renewable energy. I mean, the, the numbers are staggering. I, I'm, I'm, I'm we're doing a lot of work right now and I, I can't even crystallize <laughs> how, how significant it is. And that's why this um, conversation is so crucial. But there's a very big difference when you go from sort of the theory of how much um, renewable energy we need to so how do we actually deploy it? How do we get the capital um, that is willing to actually deploy into projects? What do those projects need to look at like? And what are the sectors? And, um, and is it really just, is it gonna be achieved with off-grid? Is it gonna be achieved only with solar? Because there are multiple dimensions for what that energy spectrum looks like. There's electrification, there's the issue of industrialization, urbanization and you know how do you manage emissions and um, sort of um, energy provision in, in, the, in the urban setting and um, you know ultimately distribution and transmission as well. And so I think one of the there are a few points I just want to get it to kind of touch on in the conversation um, and it's one of the things we're dealing with you know I think he, overarching one of the challenges with Africa or the biggest challenge with Africa is the last mile challenge where there's the last mile with telecoms the last mile with energy and we can with we've, we've done a lot we've made a lot of progress over the last 10 years on energy generation and um, you know there's been a lot of work done with the legal framework for and Roberto you can just give me like a five minute Mark, <laughs> when my time is up, thank you. Don't worry, five don't worry. I will be okay. kindly saying thank you so much. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah, just just don't do that. Just do three minutes or something, and then I'll I'll prepare my. You have my two mind. minutes for your information. Go ahead, and ah, then come back okay. later. And then come back later. All right, great, thank you. Um, you know, so I guess if, if I can just sort of be a bit fast, um, you know, the reality is that a lot of progress has been made with generation. Um, there's more to be done, but we actually need to start figuring out how to distribute and how do we actually get that generation capacity distributed. And the more we layer on renewable energy, the more we need to strengthen transmission. It's going to be very important that we consider the strengthening of transmission distribution, as well as battery and storage redundancy in grids as part of renewable energy. Um, that is going to be crucial to actually enable us to scale. 
I want to touch on some capital risks. One of our biggest challenges right now is currency because a lot of our, the governments are fiscally strained and many sovereigns no longer want to back long-term sovereign obligations in dollars. We need to solve for that. And one of the key partners to solve for dollar exposure is institutional local pension funds, but not every African country has a developed market. How can we strengthen domestic capital bases and how can we work with the European DFIs and the MDVs on suitable instruments that allow for currency blending. Um, there are many models that we're all exploring as to how to work with multiple layers of currency. We need to be open-minded as to how we do that because there's a lot of the historical models only work for generation where you have a sovereign backstop, but they don't tend to work as you really try to distribute. I'd also like one last. more point, please, on urbanization versus, versus um, rural. A lot of emphasis is on rural because there's a belief there's an impact. But remember, the more we electrify the rural communities, we only will energize aspiration. And energized aspiration means urbanization. So we've got to put a lot of capacity into livelihoods, job creation, and energy and industry in urban areas as well. So let me stop on that point, um, but I could definitely go on. Thank you, Roberto. Thank you. Thank you, Teria, for your contribution. I'm sure we'll invite you November 9. We have a a workshop on role of private sector in delivering infrastructure. You will be my guest if you give me 9 November. Thank invite you. you. <laughs> See you later. Tarie, now I have the pleasure to introduce Martin Hoffman, the program director on water energy and transport of GAZ, asking uh, Martin to give us your insight on your uh, activities, which are really very noticeable in all African country. You, I don't know if you have a slide or you will uh, just uh, for five minutes uh, tell us what JZ is up to. Thank you so much, Martin. Thank you. I just had a slide portraying a factory, actually, <laughs> because uh, just before Corona, I was traveling to a textile factory. And this factory, they had their own diesel generation um, plant on site. And the management of that factory told me they are not interested in renew renewable energy. They don't have any incentives because the diesel they pay for, they have budgeted for, and they have a 24 seven energy security. So no incentive to, to, to change. So my team uh, and myself, we told him, look, maybe we have something better for you. <laughs> Just trust us. And actually they trusted us because I mean, she has said we are not whoever. So they let us look into their books and we find out their annual electricity bill is 1 million euro. Then we've looked at the framework conditions this factory is in, and we found out, okay, with uh, solar energy, they could easily cut the bill half to only half a million euro per year. So the management board, when they heard this, they were really interested. They say, oh, please go ahead. Please tell us a bit more. So then we entered into project development, let's say pre-development. We look at legal, technical, financial aspects. And uh, also then uh, we found a good business model, model for this factory. We said, okay, you do not even have to invest any single euro by yourself. We come with the money. We come with third party ownership. So with private money is there to, to, to help you. And surprise, surprise, a couple of months later, we had a um, solar uh, scheme installed on that roof. Textile factory didn't have to spend any single Sent. So we really created here in this example a win-win-win situation. The textile factory was really happy because the electricity bill was drastically reduced. Also, of course, they save CO2. Also, the European private sector, in this case, German private sector, was um, happy because they had business opportunities, technology, service, but also the financiers to put their money. Also, the host government uh, was amused because in their country, CO2 emissions uh, went down and the jobs in that factory can be seen as a bit more greener now. Also, we, I said, of course, we were happy because we could make a contribution to reduce um, CO2. But now the question, at what price did this happen? So the German government money, we or the taxpayers' money we used for this factory, roughly 10,000 euro. And with this roughly 10,000 euro, we triggered a private investment of more than um, a bit more than uh, 1 million euro in that example. 
So I'm just telling this small story from this factory because it's um, quite um, exemplary of an approach we quite successfully um, run uh, since a couple of um, years. So the method we apply, we really go into difficult markets, right? into markets where the perceived or also existing risks, so the risks for early development um, of project is rather high. So we go in there, take the risk on the public hand, scout for opportunities, such as in, um, in the example I described. Once we identify opportunities, then we develop or pre-develop projects or so looking legal, financial, technical, um, finding the suitable business model for the client. And then also we do deal making. So we enable B2B so that the local clients can then really find the um, technical partners for services, for technology, but also the financial partners to realize um, these projects. And in many cases, it's third party ownership models, no? be it IPP or leasing models. So these kind of textile factories, mining factories, data centers, food producers, whoever, they in many cases even don't have to put any money um, by themselves. So in the last um, couple of years, we have done this now for a bit more than 700 um, factories, um, which makes a bit more than 1.4 billion euro of private investment in the pipeline, around almost half of this already realized and built. So th this just as a short input, as a quick short example, how it can work. Um, to um, if private and public work together to actually find low hanging fruits, to find good opportunities which allow RE deployment and at the same time, even business opportunities for European companies. Thank you. Can I ask you uh, uh, to uh, expand uh, your experience? You think the model you are using in this case, in this factory, it was very bright, is uh, easily expandable, is easily re replicable everywhere, or there is a limitation in this model? What is your suggestion, not only for the German industry, but also for the European industry? Absolutely, yes. So um, I would say it's very replicable. Um, and so it's basically just to make copy paste of, 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 of what we do now. And for the, let's say, the business opportunity part that, of course, then it's rather focus on European companies and not only uh, German um, uh, companies. And the current mandate we have from, from our government is only can only cover a very small percentage of the big opportunities out there in the African markets anyway. So in other words, the more mandates, the bigger mandates we have, be it from our own government, also be it from European Union or any other eligible party, um, the more uh, RE deployment we can help with this approach and also the more business opportunities could be created. Thank you so much. Uh, Martin, we'll come later for the final question, but thank you for your uh, testimony, very important. The next speaker is uh, Hervé Suquet, uh, the Vice President of the Energy in Orange Group. And I ask you to give us the, uh, the challenge that you are facing for implementing initiative where you all know that we have a lack of access to reliable electricity. So what is your, uh, your experience and your recommendation? Please, Hervé. Yes, uh, I can, can you hear me correctly? Yeah, okay. Um, so my pleasure to be with you. I'm going to, to share with you some of the challenge we are having in Orange today regarding energy to support our business across Africa. As you know, in Orange, we have committed to, uh, to provide coverage and connectivity for everyone all across our footprint in Africa. By doing this, we want to achieve net zero carbon, which means reducing strongly our CO2 emission. This is indeed creating a challenge for us. And uh, as you can see in the next slide, uh, because as you know, uh, the energy is equation is quite simple. We want to master our cost. We want to reduce our CO2 generation. Both of them are linked to the usage. The usage is roughly proportional to the traffic we are handling. Traffic is strongly growing, and which means that if we don't do anything, we will face a, a strong challenge. For this, we have to deploy an appropriate sourcing strategy and we have to de deploy efficiency plan. One of the key levers in terms of sourcing strategy is to implement PPA, corporate PPA, solar farm, solar as a service, ESCO contract, all this kind of framework need st strong investment capability, reliable, 
situation. As you can see in the next slide, we expect, thanks to all this action, to be able to increase our ratio of renewable energies quite strongly, but in fact, it's still at, at risk. It's still at risk because the grid energy mixed is also, a, the grid energy mixed evolution is also a challenge. Why the, um, the different, the framework we need to implement a long-term energy contract is not easy to reach. In most of the African country, we still don't have the needed framework. Or we don't have the stability of the framework, which will allow us to work with investors in order to deploy green energy, renewable energy. We also need investment to be made in the energy transport and distribution network, which is a challenge for us as, as a telco, we have a very distributed energy usage. So to summarize, we are confident in a range that we can reach and improve a lot of situation in terms of energy availability and renewable energy status in Africa. This will enable us to support our goal to provide connectivity to us in, in a to, to all in a responsible way. But we need for this the framework to evolve in order to provide stability for our investment and capability to finance. Thank you. So what I understand is that policy um, continuity, policy stability, and access to finance are, are the key for the, your company. Now, I have also a, a comment, a, a question. Um, telecommunication and uh, banking uh, have been the benchmark for Africa because uh, digitalization is there. How can you export this experience to the energy sector like uh, Martin did before? Do you have any suggestion to speed up the, the resistance of those who will resist to greening of energy in Africa? I think, um, uh, as it was said a little before, uh, we, we, we are all convinced that Africa is a really uh, a market of potentiality. There is a lot to be done in Africa. There are lots of people who are awaiting new service. We are awaiting for us to provide these services. It has to be adapted. The way you serve Africa continent has to be adapted to the geography, to the social economic situation of the different African, uh, African society. But there is a lot of things to be done, enabling to generate uh, new um, new jobs for lots of people and enabling to generate uh, economic progress. So we are quite convinced that all together we can deliver progress and development for Africa. Thank you so much, Hervé, for your intervention and uh, be back to you later in uh, during the meeting. Now, I have the great pleasure to introduce uh, Ambassador Antonio Sanchez Benedito, who is uh, presently the EU ambassador in Mozambique, and we appreciated his support in the first of our um, uh, program of outreach in, the, in, in Africa to provide the Rest for Africa input and um, try test the Renew Africa um, uh, paradigm. Now, can you elaborate why uh, Mozambique is uh, so interested in promoting renewable? And also, of course, uh, thanks to the colleague from uh, Schneider Electric and uh, uh, EDP from Portugal. But what is the, what really is the peculiar for Mozambique uh, to uh, your role, of course, there? Thank you. I thank you, dear, dear Roberto, Mr. Secretary General, and dear, dear friends. Uh, greetings from from Maputo, and um, and also thanks for for having shows in Mozambique as a uh, priority country for, for Renew Africa, and I think there are good reasons for it. And uh, so let me share with you a few insights uh, from the field, from a country in uh, Mozambique that is endowed with uh, huge resources that could turn the country, uh, the, uh, the powerhouse uh, for the whole Southern Africa. They are already exporting electricity, by the way, to the economic hub, to, to South Africa. Uh, on the other hand, this is a country that, is, uh, that has set a very ambitious goal. A, uh, of a, a, uh, facilitating access to the whole population by 2030. This is a, a presidential a commitment and they are doing every possible effort to try and 
and reach it or, or at least to uh, to have a good progress uh, on it because it's quite quite ambitious uh, given the fact that uh, uh, currently only 40 percent of the population has access to the electricity uh, and there are huge disparities disparities between the the rural and the and the urban areas and thirdly because uh, Mozambique, as you know, is a least developed country. That, that energy is important, not only per se, but also because of the impact uh, on most uh, a, uh, sustainable uh, development uh, goals. Um, and it has a, a very important transformative uh, uh, impact in that, in that regard. But the country is, uh, is also affected by um, climate change and climate change effects. It has suffered uh, two main cyclones in the last uh, a couple of years. And, uh, and, uh, and in that regard, the country is, uh, is uh, confronted to, to a very difficult dilemma. On the one hand, uh, they need to, to progress on this uh, facilitating electricity to the whole of the population. And for that, uh, they have a, 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 a less costly resources at their disposal, especially uh, coal and, and, and gas, uh, that is a transition energy for also for, for economic or longer term economic development. Uh, but on the other hand, they also share this uh, global consensus on the importance to decarbonize uh, the, uh, the economy and move away from the uh, fossil fuels. And that's, that's where the European Union fits in the picture. That's where we are providing all our assistance uh, for a renewable uh, energy transition, uh, Give our experience and support the uh, the whole the whole sector, uh, and and that with uh, with a holistic approach. Uh, we think it is very important to to focus on the uh, preparation uh, phase on, on on the one hand, so promoting a healthy, a conducive a, a business environment for for electricity production and distribution, and uh, and on the other hand. Uh, on the um, investment phase uh, by um, helping finance uh, mature private and, and, and public investment projects in the uh, renewable energy sector. And, and just to, to illustrate this with, it, with an example, I'd like to, to mention the, uh, our ProLED project that is uh, implemented by the Agence Française de Développement. Uh, thus, with this uh, Team Europe approach uh, that uh, was uh, mentioned by the uh, Director General and uh, a project that is quite uh, revolutionary uh, in its uh, approach because it, it, uh, it is about uh, increasing generation capacity by promoting a utility a scale, a grid connected, a solar and wind power plants, but through auctions. And, and this is the, the big difference in a country where uh, direct awarding has been the, the general rule for so many years and now, with the presence of the uh, president himself, uh, who attended the presentation, the launching of ProLED, they are they're moving away, they are shifting towards uh, this uh, an auction based and a, and a competitive uh, process. That has very important benefits on the one hand for the, uh, for the beneficiaries, for the final beneficiaries, the population, the uh, consumers that can have access to the electricity at a, at a lower price, but also they for private investors that uh, see uh, there is a, there is a more transparent uh, environment and a, and a more open uh, market uh, for their for their investments. Uh, how does a product operate? Well, on, on the two phases, on the preparatory phases with uh, technical assistance, on building a robust regulatory framework uh, for independent uh, power producers, capacitating all the national uh, uh, stakeholders, uh, helping them prepare uh, the, uh, the different uh, uh, documents for the uh, power purchase uh, agreements, but also on the investment side uh, by uh, the risking the uh, financial uh, packages with uh, grants uh, uh, for the um, public utility EDM so that they can participate or cover the uh, equity, equ equity share that they are obliged to, to cover according to the uh, a uh, Mozambican legislation, uh, but also uh, and also those grants uh, leverage leverage the debt and equity uh, support from from development uh, finance institutions and, and partners. And, and on the other hand, with uh, with the first loss uh, guarantee and non-sovereign guarantee uh, to cover uh, the the off-taker risk 
components of the uh, financial package. And this uh, through other, other instruments in our uh, toolbox, uh, the European Guarantee for Renewable uh, Energy uh, and the European Fund for, for Sustainable Development. So all in all, a very important uh, project that is uh, establishing a new kind of era in our relationships and our partnership in the energy sector that, that is having already a big impact although hey, there are some uh, mindsets that needs to be needs to be need to be changed and that will take some time but uh, and, and I and I will finish just uh, saying that uh, Prolet is a very important program we are quite proud of it and, uh, and of its potential but it is just one of the uh, the uh, of the programs or the projects that we are implementing in the energy sector with the total current investment of uh, over 180 million euros in support of renewable energy and a capacity to, to leverage almost uh, 1 billion uh, euros uh, from other sources just here in Mozambique. Thank you so over much, to you. Uh, thank you so much uh, for your um, uh, testimony and I'm really am glad to learn about this uh, um, flagship program. Now, we are coming back to your country, to Mozambique and to you in November for the second round of Renew Africa, Reds for Africa. Um, how do you, as a personal question, how do you value the fact that the group of uh, European investors come in parallel to what's happening already in the country, uh, in parallel in Brussels and in Luxembourg? How do you see our, honestly, our attempt to uh, provide additional fuel to the Mozambique government, which is doing so much, to be one of the uh, testing countries for the broader um, guarantee system. What's your opinion and what's your suggestion for me next month? <laughs> well, I will be very happy to, uh, to meet you again here in Maputo and Mozambique. This is the right time to, to come to Mozambique. Uh, the country has a, a huge potential. The challenges are also uh, yeah, very important. Uh, yeah, and, and all of us know, know them, and uh, including also instability in the north that is affecting the whole uh, the gas uh, industry, there are important hopes that are placed uh, in the gas industry. Uh, we recognize the, uh, it as a, as a, as a transitional uh, source of over energy and this capacity also to promote uh, economic growth. Uh, but uh, the focus really is on, is on renewable energy uh, and there uh, the possibilities are, are immense and only by working together, all of us. Uh, this uh, Team Europe that can also be uh, applied uh, to the private sector, uh, we can make uh, make a difference. And uh, in that regard, also we are in close contact uh, with uh, uh, European uh, companies, investors. Here, we have promoted the creation of a chamber of, uh, of European uh, investors and entrepreneurs, uh, the Eurocam, and they will be also eager to facilitate the, uh, your visit and also help in that in that regard. Thank you so much. So see you next uh, month in, uh, in uh, virtually in Mozambique for the second round of this um, exercise. Thank you so much again. Now I pass the floor to Amit Singh, the South African National Finance Manager at NetBank. NetBank uh, was the first African member of the foundation, more to come hopefully, and I asked him to provide me the ground for how the private sector can partner with the EU and mobilize investment seen from your um, uh, distinguished bank. What is your uh, perception of the priority needed? Thank you, Amit. Thank you, so Thank you Roberto. And respected panelists, uh, I think uh, it's an amazing opportunity and the most controversial and topical point that we want to add is how does private sector really in, engage with uh, the European Union and all European partners in helping electrify Africa and almost leapfrog into the renewables journey. So uh, uh, my name is Amit. I'm from a commercial bank that's been doing power project finance for the last 10, almost 20 years in the continent. Uh, so we have some experience. I can just move on to the slide, please. Yeah. Thank you. Let's move on. Yeah. So, so the idea for us is respect, please. We all know that the, what, what's the problem in Africa and, and the real challenge being the, the, the lack of power uh, and, and, and the statistics are quite clear to ourselves. We also know the current model has failed uh, Africa in terms of the big utility power, uh, big thermal units. Uh, so it is how does Africa can leapfrog into a more sustainable uh, part of uh, this journey. So what we have done in, in a way we've seen that uh, one part is that uh, we need distributed power. We need to understand how 
the economy and what was been the commercial barriers for the private sector not to invest in uh, private uh, power in the continent. And for us, the two big barriers was is the utilities has been bankrupt and there's not so enough sovereign guarantees. And the second thing is lack of the generation or distribution grid to network. And that's where we think that the European Union can play a very critical role in enabling finance and private sector investment into this space. Let's move on to the next slide, please. Yes. Thank you. Uh, we all know that the, the renewables has been the least cost producer and it can have a real meaningful value in the African content, not only providing cheap, uh, cheap power, but also enabling the commercialization and industrialization of the continent to create jobs, being an oxygen of the economy power. This is the most important thing that we think it, we know that there's a social element to this power side of it, which has to be balanced, but we also need the job creation side of it. So with, to get that balance, we think that the private sector through has an important role. We know there's many multilateral development financial institutions that's trying to work, but we need everyone. And uh, more is still not enough to help fix this problem of the lack of uh, power in the continent. Uh, so it has to be a big partnership and everyone's focus and energy is needed. The next slide, please. So when I had mentioned previously that how we feel the private sector can get involved is that, you know, we think the embedded generation of the corporate industrial side is quite an important product we should focus on. And this product being primary driven where, where you don't need, really need the utility to be a middleman, where the private sector can buy power from the IPP or a utility a, a power producer and, and almost build their own network transmission and help sustain industry. So that part, the CNI is quite important. And without that, with that, you don't need corporate government guarantees, sovereign guarantees. We don't rely on a bankrupt utility. So that's a quite important export. The other thing is wheeling. We know that the, the European Union should consider how they can uh, help facilitate wheeling of power, you know, where there's sunshine or good wind resource and then industries are different in Africa. And there we need a proper grid investment into grid in networks, grid infrastructure, and that will definitely offload a lot of power opportunities. Mini grids, we've spoken a lot in this conference. And the last thing is the role of energy trading. You know, that could also be another rule where we can almost mitigate or bypass a utility that cannot really deliver on the obligations to or provide power. Uh, next slide, please. So in order to unlock this private sector investment and this is corporate industrial side or embedded generation where you buy for yourself, uh, we think the regulatory environment is also quite important. I think the European Union can have the power to engage with these governments, African governments uh, and the ministries to help unlock and create this regulatory framework where this private off takers uh, can buy and sell power to the users of power. So that's very important. And the other important part is that, you know, they would need some form of uh, uh, funding to help develop this uh, regulatory framework. And I think the European Union can play a critical role there. So to summarize quickly is that we feel the corporate industrial space where you buy power directly from a generator and bypass the utility could be a saving grace for that. And in this model, we also know that the commercial banks would definitely be eager to put in lots of capital to, to, to really make the sector grow and, and enable and fund these projects. Thank you, Roberto. I hope I stuck within your time. Of course, Amit. Let me also ask you a question. Now, uh, Taria at the beginning said that in most countries in Africa, it's not a question of transitioning, but also developing, starting. They're not the case for South Africa. Uh, which is a very delicate uh, and there is a transitioning indeed with all the issue we have in ESCOM, we have, and you know how much we time and effort we're dedicating to support the South Africa. Can you make a, a quick uh, overview of the situation today in Africa vis-a-vis -vis the clean energy transformation? No, it's bad. Eh? You know, load shedding is becoming a way of life here. Yeah. If you go to most African countries, a diesel generator is the only way that you can uh, keep your economy or your house uh, powered up. So it's it's a bad problem we have here. Uh, and, and the bigger problem we have, lack of jobs. Remember, unemployment is at the highest. Uh, consider South Africa statistics. And to get us out of this and get our country rolling in terms of GDP growth, we need power. If you want to open a factory, you have to go to uh, get an application for power connection. And that's not available at this stage because of the real shortage of power. So the 
situation is bad, uh, we know that renewables are the least produce, cost producer. It's quickly, easy, deployable. It doesn't really take five, six years to go to, to install and, and get it commissioned. Within two years, you can get a wind farm up and running. Within 12, six to eight, 12 months, you can get a PV farm running. Uh, but in South Africa, we have big constraints. We have the grid that cannot understand, take on more renewables. So we need to understand how mid merit power fits in the bigger grid. We have an old thermal fleet that's going to make uh, this size is even worse. Uh, and, and we need everyone's help to get this going. So the currently, you know, if you look at the ESCOM situation, is that they, they are not really investing much in the grid infrastructure because their finances are also stuck and strapped because of the huge debt that they have. You know, they pay most of the revenue out to, this, to service their bank loans or their multilateral loans. So they cannot invest in, into grid network and infrastructure. So the European Union and the Euro, European partners, I think they definitely need to step in and help ESCOM to develop the grid and the network so that we can install more power, renewable power uh, into the system. And, then, and that can be quick and easy you know, rather than developing big thermal kits, uh, which is, cannot be funded and, and it's really obsolete these days. So the renewable future is important, but we need the European uh, partners to help ESCOM to unlock the grid. Thank you, Roberto. Thank you so much, Amit, and for your testimony. And uh, I'm really proud of having you as a, a, a spot from uh, Southern Africa and not only. Uh, We're also very proud of the efforts of the foundation, Roberto, under your leadership. Thank you. So thank much. you. Yes. I thank you so much. I try hard. Motivation again. I said I'm 75, but I feel much younger. My idea is that you feel young until you have a project. Uh, and if you don't have any project, you can old be old at 30 years old. Now the last speaker, not the last but not the least speaker, is Casper Ellsberg. Casper is a president of Middle East and Africa Schneider Electric, and we know how much uh, professionality and passion Schneider Electric is putting in Africa. So, Casper, tell me um, what what is the, 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 the philosophy, the, the reason why, and the success story of Schneider Electric in Africa. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Roberto. Thank you all for, I think, the foundation for having us here in this important uh, discussion. So if you like, our purpose is, as a company, as Schneider Electric, is to empower all to make the most out of our energy, out, out of our resources, bridging progress, and sustainability for all. And what that means in the context for Africa, of course, is that we focus on energy distribution, that famous, not just that famous last mile, but this is clearly an important part of it, that we focus on access to energy, right? Uh, bringing electricity to the people who don't have it. Uh, and this ranges really from solar powered lamps to renewable microgrids, to very large solar farms, all of them powered uh, with, with our solutions to digitizing the national grid, to that very important point just made uh, by, by Mr. Amit, on uh, that the grids very often are not ready to receive renewable uh, energy, right? To actually making large uh, mines and manufacturing plants uh, energy efficient. So we operate in almost every country in Africa. I'm, I'm, uh, we have offices in most, and uh, our solutions, uh, you know, they... they, they uh, they power villages in Nigeria. They do. We do large uh, thermal solar complexes in Morocco and Egypt. Uh, we do microgrids in, as I said, in almost every country uh, in Africa. We do large the, the renewable uh, uh, installations that power, for example, the Mall of Africa in uh, in South Africa. Right, that that famous mixed use uh, real estate uh, development. Now, that's our story, and this is, of course, it's going very well for us. It's a big market. It's a very important market for Schneider Electric. Uh, we are here with uh, several thousand people on the ground. Uh, um, if you ask me the challenges, right, on the finance side, on making it happen side, I mean, if I have to break them down, if you allow me, I mean, this is the forum, right? Uh, they are really in, in, in conceptually, in, for me, made mainly in three areas. Right. One, there are technical challenges because, as we've just uh, heard, the grids are not digitized enough. They're not ready to feed back renewables into the grid. Right. So this is uh, something ultimately uh, investment and focus at the national level in every country in Africa. Just imagine how difficult that is. Right. Uh, is going to solve. Right. Uh, if it's difficult in ESCOM, uh, it is certainly 
as difficult, if not more difficult, elsewhere with with some good outliers, uh, uh, not notwithstanding, right? The second part, and I think this feeds into this, the, the discussion that we're having today, is really the, a regulatory framework that favors renewables, right? That is in, in a country, but also cross-continent or at least cross-regionally, because that's really missing uh, in most places. There is no incentive. There are maybe, as uh, Mr. Martin said, there are uh, business case bottom-up incentives to switch from diesel to uh, to renewables, but there are not really national frameworks uh, at, uh, that are implemented and uh, enforced, right, that, uh, that favor renewables. And ultimately, as we've seen in the West, right, you need both uh, top-down and bottom-up approach to, uh, to renewables. At least this is certainly my experience and, and my, uh, yeah, my, 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 my wish, if you like, right? And that is where foundations such as Rest for Africa and, for, and uh, institutions like the EU and others can really support uh, like institutions on the African side to put, you know, with, with, with know-how on building regular, sim simple, implementable regulatory frameworks that favor uh, renewables. Otherwise, uh, what you said at the very beginning is going to happen, that yes, there will be more energy and it will also consume, of course, significantly more carbon. Now, there's a last point that I, I want to make, which is really, really, I mean, we talk a lot about the, the, the mini grids, micro grids, we talk about the large farms. We don't talk a lot about the capacity building and the skills development and the maintenance skills and the investment in people, in companies, in companies that provide these services to these grids on the ground in Africa. And I think this needs to be as much a focus, so the wider ecosystem of renewable energy, right, from the electrician to, uh, to the operator in a solar plant, uh, investing in these type of, not just the skills, but in companies that provide these services, and again, in frameworks that favor these type of services so that there's work for them to do, I think this is a... a a big challenge, a big task, uh, and a big opportunity for 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 investors. Right, that be my my comments in summary. Thank you, Casper. Uh, a that. quick question for you specific. Uh, you heard yeah. before that the telecommunication and banking already use the digitalization, and you always tell me, Roberto, before we go to the power sector, what is the the challenge for digitalization of the power sector? No, yeah, I mean, uh, so digitization is twofold, right? It's, uh, uh, it is putting in software, putting in uh, the, 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 the operating models and so on. And then it is connecting every connectable part of a grid of the last mile, you know, and using it to save energy. And that is a, a big task when it comes to the grid that is easier easier, not easy, with, uh, with solar farms, with microgrids, right? But at the end of the day, these are very large projects, right? We are doing one at the moment in Egypt, so at the very north of Africa. These are, uh, you know, uh, uh, thousands of, 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 of installations that need to be upgraded just for, you know, uh, uh, half of a city the size of Cairo. So if you... Uh, multiply that across Africa. These are big efforts. Uh, at the end of the day, we need to do them as 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 people, as governments, as uh, you know. Um, and I hope that you know in the next ten years we will see a lot of progress there on connecting. Yeah. Thank you. Now we, I'm asking you the so-called one million dollar one minute uh, question. I'm asking to anybody who wants to jump in. Hopefully, everybody to tell me the most important uh, uh, factor for having public and private sector working together finally to allow financing in Africa. So anybody who wants to tell me the message they want to uh, give us as we put in a stone as our uh, outcomes. So, Taye, you are the first one, of course, because you do infrastructure. Play go. Bankability, but bankability, there's a lot that goes into bankability, but... Uh, Bankability, but then also policy consistency. Um, mm -hmm. So that's always a, a big challenge is really policy consistency and um, 
um, credibility and trust, which actually underpins um, bankability, really. Okay, thank you. Anybody else? A better, I can go quickly. Anyway. Um, from, from our point of view, I think the uh, stability of uh, the environment, be it uh, from a regulatory point of view or political point of view, is clearly something which is mandatory uh, to enable the right financing. Okay. Somebody else? Yes. If it's okay, thank you. It's Amit here. Yeah, I, I think it cannot be business as usual because that model has failed Africa. <laughs> we have renewables that can leapfrog as the mobile phone leapfrogged uh, communication in Africa the, from the landlines. Renewables can do it with some support from the, from the international multilateral agencies and the European Commission and the European partners. I think we can create the frameworks for the private sector to deliver which governments cannot deliver. Thank you. Now the director, Mr. Dunes, what is your message for private private sector? It was so difficult for me to be accepted in Brussels, you know, tell me, sorry. <laughs> no, no, I mean, uh, my, my, my single recommendation is to uh, keep hammering home, keep mobilizing on us. Uh, because frankly speaking, I mean, if ever the appetite for us to work with the private sector has never been bigger than it is it is now and we clearly look at this i mean it's like when you want to sit on a chair i mean you you'd better have four um four pillars to sit on if if one or two <laughs> of these of these of these feet are missing your your chair is unstable um and 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 that's why i find it hard to pick one or two things because i i i honestly think that it can only work if we move forward on all these tracks in parallel and and when i've listened to some of the speakers some of you will insist on bankable pipeline and others on uh, stability and others on a regulatory framework and i think that actually we'll need to move with all of it mm -hmm. in parallel because as soon as one stays behind it's like one leg of your chair is missing and it becomes an unstable and that's why these kind of gatherings where um, I mean, we will get the more and more concrete eh? um, when we specifically look at specific countries, specific bankable projects, and so on and so on. And that's when we then need to mobilize all, all of us. That, that's very much how, how I sense it. So keep, keep uh, I mean, keep play, playing close on the ball with us. Thank you. Martin, who is the GIZ chair? Do we have four legs? I would totally agree that we do need these four legs or even more. And I think also there are many good examples where there have been successful instruments and methods been applied. So I think it's not necessarily always about inventing new things, but rather to focusing also what's the successful. And often also it just depends on political mandates, uh, which can be expanded and increased, and then um, things can move ahead. Eh? Ambassador Antonio. Do you have four legs? You sit in a chair, so you probably have four legs. Tell me. <laughs> well, you know the uh, the African uh, the African chair has got three legs, and uh, and those three legs, I would say, are the uh, public institutions, the government. So nothing can be done if there isn't a bigger commitment on the government side, and they don't have the capacities. The private sector, they for sure, eh? and I can only confirm the director general's instructions that come to the delegations in, in the field on the ground work with the private sector. Private sector is a key development actor. They are allies. Okay? So we are we are working on that and, you know, making everything possible. And then the, the third leg is, uh, I mean, us, no? We are partners. We are there to, to try and, and connect the dots and, uh, and mobilize resources and work on the, uh, on the overall uh, the framework. So, uh, eh, uh, but is that, there is some work to do, but we can only do it together. Kasper, your chair. Uh, my, well, I think what everyone said is very, very true. I think the big challenge continues to be the regulatory fragmentation of Africa that make pan-African business strategies very difficult, right? The more we focus on uh, coming up, I come to my point again, with frameworks that create a similar environment when it comes to renewables in as many countries across Africa as possible, the more business 
will find it easy to execute against the opportunities, which is what I think we uh, we want. Right? And uh, Tarie, also for gender balance, you are the only women against these men. So, mm -hmm. can you comment a final word? But also, can you answer a question I received on the role of bureaucracy, which you know kills uh, the private sector? Mm -hmm. Do you have any problem with the bureaucracy in, in, when you work? And how do you do you, you do you overcome the bureaucracy? Because this is a typical problem also in my country. Eh? Please, Daria, you have the last the last words. So we'll <laughs> thank you for the privilege. Um, you know, I I do have the benefit of of running a very nimble team that has to deal with bureaucracies in government as well as bureaucracies with international capital like the DFIs. Mm -hmm. And I think it's very important that we all, I mean, bureaucracy has its role because bureaucracy is actually sort of comes from governance and high quality structure and best practice. But then bureaucracy, <laughs> but uh, bureaucracy forms when that just becomes a constraint. And I think in order for us to deliver the type of action at the scale we need, we need to think about ways to simplify, streamline, and actually get capital working. And so I think all of us, the public, the private, and the DFI community need to work together to figure out the hacks, the workarounds, and the ways to deploy capital while still um, working with good quality funds, sponsors, um, organizations of integrity, but really figuring out a way to deliver that capital and to sort of do more than just process opportunity, but to actually deploy capital and deliver on opportunities. Um, mm -hmm. I think there's a little bit too much processing going on right now. Thank you so much. I think I'm going to close with giving the floor to Stefan for the conclusion. I hope we had a good panel. Stefan, you can send us through email some good Belgian chocolate. Uh, Canadians can provide us some uh, address. But I think uh, I, really, I really, well, Belgian chocolate is even better than Italian. But I think I enjoy very much the quality uh, of your intervention. And be sure I'll get you back in our next events so I can profit of your wisdom. Uh, Stefan? Yes, I'm there. Thank you very much for everyone uh, of providing this, uh, a lot of insights, but doesn't make it easy to conclude. But the last point raised makes it a little bit very large scale again, or very, yeah, difficult. While after I heard uh, Mrs. Gabi de Gissing first, she made it very clear, have a good local understanding eh? with, with uh, examples of tackling domestic capital reserve, currency blending mechanisms, do not focus too much on rural uh, because it energizes also urbanization. And also Mr. Singh pointed out, I think on the, and not one size fits all when he talked about this model of diversified and embedded uh, generation. So the first thing, I think, and Risk for Africa has also worked in that, is get to get a good in-depth local understanding. And the GIZ project, I found it fascinating, eh? of, in the seven factories, going very, very local, and then with relatively small investment of being local, being able then to attract the investment and make it possible. So that, I think, is the first lesson, and I think, when I look at what Team Europe, eh, what Kundus was talking about in, in Team Europe, or what uh, Rest for Africa is doing in outreach and capacity building, that is something to build upon. Eh? And that will make uh, the last sentences that uh, that um, that you mentioned, uh, Ms. Gavadgesi, uh, is very important. Eh? Do it. Eh? And then the capital will work and then we can see it work. So that's one thing, the local element and are building up that experience at scale. Of course, there is the issue of frameworks, grids, etc., which require larger investment. But then I also think uh, the tools that, that Mr. Dunes presented, uh, the financial support work, the advocacy work stream of, uh, of Rest for Africa can help on that. And then the last in the difficult, or more difficult maybe, the stability of empowerment, regulatory unity. And of course, we can... Mr. Hesber said a uh, pan-African regulatory unity on this, but that might be a far-reaching goal, I think. 
And then the only answer that I hear on that one is keep on connecting the dots, keep on providing the, the examples, keep on providing the best practices in a lot of putting energy in the, the kind of alignment between the different actors to show that. That would be my conclusion from these three elements of the local, and uh, yeah, starting from the local, I think is a, would be my conclusion of this session. But I don't know if you agree with that, and I would like to give the last final, final word to you, and then we are just over time, so you manage very well enough. We are... Yep. Please, uh, I, I prefer to have a last word from uh, Kundun's. Uh, don't forget uh, uh, bitter chocolate, eh? Otherwise, I send you Kinder. I want a bitter chocolate because my age... I will only... It's only bitter chocolate, good belt chocolate. Please, can, can you conclude on the contrary? Because we think uh, you can reiterate what you said and how you see again this issue of public and private, which kills me for two years, but now finally we are there. Please. <laughs> I mean, for, first, first a comment about the bureaucracy isn't only killing you, it's killing us as well. We, <laughs> we, we, we are as much on the suffering end of bureaucracy and procedures as, uh, as you are. No, I mean, I, I have very little to, to conclude upon. I think that this is, this is as I've said, exactly the kind of discussions uh, we should have. And as Antonio said, it's something I insist on a lot. Um, for me, the real work is done at country level, because that's where the real action sits. Um, the, and, and, and you seem to all agree that in order to produce real impact, a number of things have to align in parallel. And uh, whereas a continental perspective and a sub-regional perspective are absolutely crucial, the, the alpha and omega, the starting point and the end point, is what actually happens on the ground in a certain country. And that's why I'm so keen on pushing the delegations, working with the delegations, so that they link up and beyond the kind of broader conversations we are having at our level, that really locally this kind of discussion happens with the private sector, with the development finance institutions so that we can bring all the players together in something coherent. And this is really my, my wish. Um, we, we can, I mean, as, as one of the African presidents uh, likes to tell us, I, I will not tell you who it is, um, it, it, he says, well, we tend to talk a lot, but I would like to see a bit less talking and a bit more action on the ground. And I think that all of us uh, uh, will, will embrace that kind of wish and that's why I hope that between now and the summit and after the summit that we will be having, that we can really focus our work now. What, what is the list of concrete, concrete things we can start doing? What do we see as a set of actions on which if we gather together, we can produce real results on the ground? Thank you so much. I will uh, certainly uh, take note of this uh, final blessing from the Commission. And I will enlist you in my newsletter and my news so you can be informed and I will catch you back because I think you are wonderful people. I have a dream team today. Arrivederci. If you come to Roma, Cache Pepe, I will invite you to have the real Cache Pepe, not the one in Belgium. In France, can they give me Cache Pepe with garlic. I say, come on, you French people have garlic? Oh, no, no, no. Cache Pepe, no garlic. Okay. Arrivederci a tutti. It's a pleasure. Arrivederci. Bye bye. Pleasure. Bye, Roberto. Bye-bye. Thank you all. Bye. Thank you. Have a good day. Cheers.